The debt service coverage ratio is a very simple formula, but this one metric can have some really big impacts on commercial real estate investors. And even though it's pretty easy to look up the definition of this term online, there isn't much information out there on how the DSCR is actually applied in a real estate context and how this comes into play throughout an entire loan term. So whether you're in the process of looking for analyst roles and want to make sure you can talk through this concept in an interview, or if you're just trying to understand this metric when doing your own deals, this video walks through what the debt service coverage ratio actually is, how this is used within the commercial real estate industry, and exactly when this comes into play for a real estate investor. So to start out, we need to define what this actually is and the debt service coverage ratio or DSCR for short measures the number of times over the annual net operating income of a property can cover annual debt service. This means that this metric can tell both a lender and a borrower how well a property's operations can support the borrower's required monthly loan payments with a higher debt service coverage ratio indicating a lower risk of default, all else being equal. And because of this, commercial real estate lenders will often use a minimum acceptable DSCR to determine the total loan proceeds they're willing to issue on a deal, and this is often referred to in the industry as a loan constraint. Now, DSCR constraints for lenders can vary a lot based on the location of a property, the property type itself, and the overall risk profile of a deal, but in most cases, commercial real estate lenders will require a debt service coverage ratio of anywhere between about 1.25x and 1.5x for both acquisition loans and property refinances. And the reason why they require this is because a DSCR that's within this range makes sure that the lender knows that based on the going in NOI of a property, the borrower could see that NOI drop by 10%, 20%, or even 30% in some cases from the time the loan proceeds are initially issued and still have cash flow available to service that loan. Now, once the lender decides what that minimum DSCR value needs to be, they're then going to use this to back solve for a loan amount, and this can be calculated directly by using the PV function in Excel. Excel's PV function can calculate a loan amount based on an interest rate, an amortization period, and a monthly payment amount. And if we have a property's projected NOI and the DSCR constraint directly from the lender, we can use all of this together to calculate loan proceeds. And to run through an example of this, if a lender was evaluating a deal where they plan to charge a 5.5% interest rate with a 30-year amortization period, the going in annual NOI of the property was projected to be $100,000 in the mid minimum DSCR they'd be willing to accept was 1.25x, this loan could be sized in Excel by using the PV function with a 5.5% interest rate being divided by 12 to calculate a monthly rate first, the 30-year amortization period also being converted to a number of months to calculate the number of periods within this function, and then finally the $100,000 NOI being divided by 1.25 to calculate the annual maximum loan payment and then dividing this by 12 to also convert this to a monthly amount. All of this together produces a loan amount of $1,174,145. And if we use Excel's PMT function to check this and calculate our monthly loan payment based on this amount, we get $6,667 or $80,000 per year, making our $100,000 NOI exactly 1.25 times our annual debt service obligation. Now, the DSCR is obviously important when a property is being acquired and a lender is sizing a loan in the first place, but the DSCR is also really important to track for both lenders and borrowers throughout the entire loan term for a few different reasons. First, if the DSCR in a deal falls below a certain threshold, lenders will typically put that loan on what's referred to as their watch list, which essentially means they'll be looking for extra communication with the borrower to make sure property performance is trending in a positive direction, and if not, the borrower has a plan to turn things around quickly. In a lot of cases, a loan being added to a lender's watch list will also come with more stringent reporting requirements, increasing the frequency that borrowers need to provide the lender with things like updated financial statements, updated rent rolls, or leasing activity reports for struggling commercial properties. And in some cases, a borrower falling below a certain DSCR threshold can actually trigger an immediate loan default, which even if this doesn't result in foreclosure immediately, can trigger things like additional 
additional equity funding requirements to add to a reserve account, additional fees or penalties charged by the lender, or even the lender requesting full repayment of the loan before that loan matures. Now, in most cases, lenders are willing to work with borrowers to prevent a foreclosure scenario if possible, often by either temporarily or permanently modifying loan terms. But knowing that this type of situation could come into play for an investor, even if they are able to service their debt on a monthly basis, is extremely important to know before going into a deal. And aside from just the importance of the DSCR during the loan term itself, the second reason this is important to track over time is that if the borrower wants to hold onto a property beyond the initial loan term, the DSCR can also play a really big role during a refinance, especially in situations like we're seeing in the market today where interest rates have increased significantly over the last few years, this can end up being a huge limiting factor for investors when it comes to loan proceeds. And to put this into context, if a property generating a million dollars of annual NOI was acquired back in 2019 and financed with a loan that was sized based on a 1.3x DSCR constraint at that time using a 4.25% interest rate and a 30 year amortization period, the loan amount at acquisition would have been a little over $13 million. But if we assume that this was a five year loan term and we fast forward to 2024, even if we assume that the NOI of this property has grown by 3% per year over the last five years, today, if that interest rate was now 6.5% using that same 30 year amortization period and 1.3x DSCR constraint, that same lender would now only be willing to fund $11.75 million in total loan proceeds. And in this case, even with five years of principal payment, Payments, reducing that loan balance to just $11.8 million at maturity, these refinance proceeds still couldn't cover this. And in scenarios where loans were full term interest only, or the NOI of the property didn't increase significantly during the loan term, this is where investors are starting to run into trouble. This is what the industry is referring to today as the debt funding gap, which is causing borrowers to either have to do cash in refinances and contribute additional equity just to pay off outstanding loans or potentially even sell properties at a loss just to pay off the original lender. Ultimately, the DSCR is a really important metric for both lenders and equity investors in commercial real estate. And I hope this was helpful to get a better sense of the impacts this metric can have. And if you wanna learn more about different loan terms that often come up on commercial real estate deals, and you wanna learn how to model these terms directly in Excel, make sure to check out our all-in-one membership trading platform, Breaking a CRE Academy. A membership to the Academy will give you instant access to over 120 hours of video training on real estate financial modeling and analysis. You'll get access to hundreds of practice Excel interview exam questions, sample acquisition case studies, and you'll also get access to the Breaking a CRE Analyst Certification Exam, which covers topics like real estate pro forma and development modeling, commercial real estate lease modeling, equity waterfall modeling, and many other real estate financial analysis concepts that will help you prove to employers that you have what it takes to tackle the responsibilities of an analyst or associate at a top real estate firm. And if you like this video and want to see more content on the channel on different commercial real estate loan terms, make sure to hit the like button and let me know. And let me know in the comments directly what other debt related topics you'd like to see covered in more detail in a future video. As always, thanks so much for watching guys. I hope you found this helpful. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already to see more videos like this every single week and I'll see you in the next video.